Welcome, gentle listener. I am Voldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and units of the Warhammer 40k universe. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. And today, we are to take a brief look at the most martial and able race and group of warriors in the entire setting. For make no mistake, the Eldar are a warrior race without compare. They were forged for it, bred for it, made for it. War, and war alone. For the Eldar hail from the very beginning. They are survivors of the war in heaven, that terrible clash of forces at the dawn of the Warhammer 40k universe that cannot be described, cannot be encompassed by any mere mortal. So dire were the powers unleashed in this titanic struggle that lasted for eons, for millions of years. But of all of the remains of that horror, the Eldar were the race that would inherit the very stars. When the Catan had been brought to heel by the Necron slaves, the remaining dynasties knew they could not face the powers of the now expansive Eldari Empire and the vast tides of Krok, the ancestors of the Orcs. So they fled through time from the warlike Eldar and hid in stasis crypts until the Eldar would consume themselves, which happened, of course. But for further details, please see my video on the Harlequins, or if you have the stomach for it, the Homunculi Covens for they cover the fall of the Eldar in depth. But it can never be forgotten that the Eldar have been rulers of the Milky Way galaxy, probably far longer than any others. For the Necrons had but fleeting years between their final battles with the Catan and their retreat into slumber. The humans, in the form of the Imperium of Mankind, have only ruled for a mere 10,000 years. And during their zenith, their age of technology... Even then, they did not face off against the latter year's Elderai Empire. So, for between 20 to 60 million years, depending on the source, the Eldar have ruled the galaxy. No mean feat. For they were able to cull the crook, pull them apart, set them against each other, then fall upon them to such an extent that the once proud race of organized and disciplined warriors became the Orcs. Bands of barely capable killing machines without a shred of their former power. And they held the orcs down like this for millions of years. They were never truly challenged, according to their law. So every single emerging race, power, empire or principality that sprang up in all of those years, they were crushed with ease. Nothing could challenge the Eldar. And it is not difficult to see why for at their height they were untouchable. Most of this being hardwired into their very DNA by their creators, the Old Ones. Their connection to the warp and the ability to harness it is second to none. The mightiest human psyche may have as much raw power as an Eldar, but they will ever be without the consummate skill and natural ability of their opponent. Where a human can shout in the warp, the Eldar can whisper in a million languages dance to a more subtle tune, weave wonders that the human would not be able to even conceive of, let alone master. And they are robust, swift and able, all of them. Eldar experience the universe in a different way to other races, richer, deeper, just more. For their senses are so much more acute than most, their lives experienced at a different pace and tempo. Their ability to move at speeds most would consider a blur, to react as swiftly as the genetically augmented monsters that are the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines. They all move this fast. They experience emotions to an extent and intensity impossible for a human to understand. When one is mourning, it is as if their weeping could drown the very stars, and when they are celebrating, their joy is enough to fill the void. But it is also their greatest threat, their most dire weakness. For the Eldar are like the light that burns, so one would imagine that they are swift of life, short of longevity. Alas, as with all such archetypal elf copies, 
they have extremely long lifespans, so much so that many construe them as immortal. This means that they have time on their side, which can be fundamental. For imagine how adept you would be at a task, any task, if you had hundreds of years to perfect your craft. So when combined, these traits all add up to make the Elder the premier warrior race in the entire galaxy. They are so swift and able that even their civilian militia is a thing of dread. But we are to go into the far more bright and also terrible nature of those Eldar who walk the path of Kairam and Shakain. They are known as the Aspect Warriors, and they are without peer in all of the universe. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote, The Asuyani Path As protection against the lure of excess and to guard against any recurrence of the fall, the people of the craft worlds adhere to a set of strictures known as the Path. Through the rigid emotional discipline of the Path, they master their inclination towards sensation-seeking. Instead, focusing their prodigious intellects and energies upon the pursuit of one specific goal. Since the fall, those elder eye who fled upon the craft worlds have faced their inescapable doom. The battles they have fought in the name of survival have been many and violent. Yet their most important struggle is a spiritual one, for the nature of their psyche remains fundamentally unchanged. As ever they were, the elder eye are prone to emotional extremes. Perhaps the greatest difference between the ancient Elderai and their descendants is that the craftworlders have learned to fear wanton experience, shunning the indulgences of the past. To ensure temptation is put behind them, the philosophy often called Ai Elethra, or the path, governs every aspect of craftworld life, enabling the Azuyani to harness their emotional and intellectual intensity safely without jeopardizing themselves or those around them. In adult life, every Azuyani chooses for themselves a discipline that they make their task to master to the exclusion of all else. Each discipline is a path unto itself, and each path may necessitate further choices and specializations. It is a concentration of effort that encompasses every aspect of the devotee's life, once an Asuyani has walked a path for long enough, they choose another, and then another. Though they forsake each path in turn, the soul is nourished by the experiences upon it. A craft worlder may tread many different paths in their life, and the skills they learn on each journey serve to enrich further accomplishments. To the Asuyani, all avenues of experience are strewn with dangers, for their minds are capable of depth and understanding that goes beyond the concept of mere human obsession. Such dangers are often likened to traps or nets, waiting to catch the unwary and hold them fast in the chains of compulsion. When an Azuyani's mind becomes so completely focused upon one thing that they can no longer make the change to another discipline, they are said to be lost upon the path. This is a frightening and final fate for all craft worlders, and it can befall any of their kind despite the discipline and training that they receive. In the case of the warrior path, these individuals are called exarchs. Though there are examples that correspond to other paths, such as the crystal seers and the doomed bards of twilight, there are innumerable paths open for an elder to explore, some as common as the path of the artisan, others as rare and dangerous as the path of the seer. Each offers its followers a complete way of life. Those Asuyani who have mastered the less esoteric paths are no less respected than their brethren. After all, the artisans are those who create the craft worlds themselves and their contents, calling masterpieces into being with the care a musician lavishes upon his harp or a warrior upon his sword. 
It is from the ranks of those upon civilian paths such as these that the Guardian Militia are mustered in times of need, as the Elderly are so few in number that they are required to gird themselves for battle. The Path of the Warrior The Elderly are a race beset on all sides by hostile forces, and warfare has become a way of life. Would that it were not this way, for Elderly generations are few and far between, and they can ill afford to lose any of their number. Young Asuyani often believe that they can rebuild the glory of their empire with fire and passion. But their elders know that their shattered civilization is lost in a struggle for simple survival. Because of this unavoidable truth, more and more Asuyani are needed to walk the warrior path with every passing year. Such is the dark nature of the Elder Eye Psyche. More craft workers find themselves answering this call to war at some point in their long lives, out of choice rather than necessity. The path of the warrior teaches the arts of death and destruction. In Eon's past, the ancient Phoenix Lords taught the arts of war to both male and female. As a result, as Yuani warriors are as likely to come from either sex. As with many of the more complex paths, the warrior path is divided into many separate branches. Each of these is known as a warrior aspect, representing a different facet of the war god Cain, and bringing with it unique fighting techniques, weapons and abilities. The aspects differ greatly in their methods of warfare, and offer specialist skills perfectly refined for specific battlefield roles. Each aspect upon a craft world keeps at least one shrine in which to practice the mastery of their warrior path, a sanctum wholly dedicated to the pursuit of perfecting destruction. When the Asuyani go to war, the warrior aspects fight in a predetermined role associated with their shrine. They have their own warrior garb, a form of ritual battle suit, the distinctive weaponry, ranging from the fusion guns of the Fire Dragons to the sleek nightshade jet fighters of the Crimson Hunters. Their minds and bodies are honed with endless exercise, both physical and spiritual, until they become suffused with the aspect of Caelum and Shakain that their shrine represents. The aspect warriors do not live in the shrines, and when they put aside their ritual masks and uniforms, they can walk at peace through their craft world. Only the keepers of each shrine, the Exarchs, live within them, unable and unwilling to escape. Some aspects, such as the slicing orbs of Xandros, are unique to a specific craft world. Others are common to most, with the most famous and well-established being the Dire Avengers, the Howling Banshees, the Striking Scorpions, the Fire Dragons, the Swooping Hawks, and the Dark Reapers. In battle, each aspect plays its own part with the skill of a virtuoso. Their singular abilities combining in a symphony of destruction that is far greater than the sum of its parts. From the most numerous horde to the mightiest enemy war machine, there is a cadre of the craft world's warriors with skills and weapons suited to its annihilation. Combined with the prescience of the Farseers and the strategic genius of the Autarchs who command the war host, even a small strike force can devastate its opponents with little fear of reprisal. The Asuyani ideal is to eradicate those who oppose them without a single loss from their own ranks. For the usurpers are many, and the Elderi are few. They cannot afford to throw away their lives in the manner of the cruder races they face. Every craft would are lost in battle would have been sacrificed because there was no other choice and at great cost to the enemy, for in comparison, the lives of other races are worthless. Craft World War Hosts The Asuyani War Hosts carve through the ranks of their enemies. Guided by the military genius of their autarchs and the prescience of their Farseers, they turn their minds to war with a single deadly purpose, dispatching their foes with blistering speed and masterful skill. Grace in battle and merciless efficiency are prized virtues of craft world armies. The war hosts are led by those who epitomize such traits, the Autarchs. 
These are Eldorai who have walked the path of the warrior for decades or even centuries, yet resisted the taint of Cain's red madness. Theirs is a vital role, for the Autarchs alone tread the esteemed path of command. If the Autarchs are the hand that grips the blade, then it is the Farseers who guide its aim. The bond between Autarch and Farseer can shape a war host, and even if neither takes to the field directly, it is their combined vision that will be the difference between victory and defeat. The Farseer's psychic mastery also elevates the warriors around them, complementing the aggressive powers of the Warlocks. Though some Azurani war hosts still comprise only aspect warriors, the millennia have taken their toll, and it is now all too common for war hosts to rely upon a core of elder-like guardians. Those who through necessity have donned the mask of the killer, despite their past being one of peace. It is a testament to the Azuyani skill at war that even their citizen militia can overcome the armies of the lesser races. Well motivated and expertly led, even a modest war host of guardians can outclass an army many times its size. If in need of a stalwart defense, an autarch can order guardian crude weapon platforms and eldritch artillery to sway the battlefield in ash and fire, while wind riders, storm guardians, and grav tank squadrons dart in at their behest, providing lightning swift spears with which to spit their foes. Driven by the peerless skill and obsessive focus of their exarchs, the warriors of the Aspect Shrines form their own strike forces within the Craftworld armies. These are the most adept of all their kin, and Autarchs must use their talents wisely. Like razor-tipped arrows, each one is loosed into the enemy where it might do the most harm. In times of great need, Autarchs can also call upon ghost lesions of wraith constructs, keen-eyed rangers, and even the avatar of the bloody-handed god. As the 41st millennium draws to a close, such warriors are forced to take the field with disturbing frequency knowing they must fight or fade away forever. Exarchs. In theory, an Azuyani is capable of compartmentalizing and controlling their warrior cells, casting aside their blood-hungry persona just as they would their war gear. When an aspect warrior loses this ability to disassociate from their killer self, they become an Exarch. High Priests of Cain, Exarchs are the keepers of the bloody-handed god's shrines and the teachers of his creed, and their abilities are far more developed than even the finely honed aspect warriors whom they lead to battle. Their lives are utterly dedicated to their aspect's particular way of war and the teaching, training, and ceremony that go with it. Upon initiation, an exarch will don an elaborate version of aspect warrior armor studded with waystones that contain the souls of their shrine's previous exarchs. The wearer will assume the sacred name associated with the armor, and his own spirit mingles with those of the departed. So empowered, the exarch can draw upon the skill, wisdom, and emotions of their predecessors, and any remaining sense of themselves as a distinct being is lost amidst a suzerus of the dead. It is a process that can never be reversed, and all who undergo it spend the rest of their days held in both fear and awe by their kin. The Phoenix Lords The Phoenix Lords are the most ancient of the Exarchs. Each Phoenix Lord founded one of the warrior shrines of the Azuyani and is the embodiment of an aspect of the war god Cain. They are immortal after a fashion, for when a Phoenix Lord is slain, another inherits their panoply of war and fully assumes their identity. In this way, a Phoenix Lord is reborn into a fresh cycle of existence, reincarnated in a way familiar to all Elder Eye before the fall. Each Phoenix Lord's armor contains a spirit stone that contains a fragment of those that have come before. However, no matter how many individuals are incorporated, a Phoenix Lord's essence is forever the same. Their mind, driven by the dominant personality, of the first and greatest incarnation to ever don the aspect. Over the millennia, each of the Phoenix Lords has disappeared for periods of centuries or longer before suddenly reappearing, 
However, since the coming of the Great Rift, all the Phoenix Lords have manifested, including several times when they have all arrived and fought at the same battle. This exceptional event is known in the tongue of the Elder Eye as Ryogir Blur, roughly meaning gathering of fire or conflux of battle. The Asuyata The Asuyata, the legend of the Phoenix Lords, is an ancient epic that is only recited in full once in each generation. Though it is known in its entirety only to a mystical order of storytellers and poets called the Bards of Twilight, the Asuyata features many important parables and teachings which the Elder Eye of the Craft Worlds use as guiding principles to inform both their day-to-day -day activities and the actions taken by their war councils. Clash of Flames It is rare for the craft worlders to fight amongst themselves, but there are some instances where war hosts of opposing world ships have come to blows. It is not so difficult to imagine the causes. The Asuyani can be haughty and proud, having their own traditions while being intolerant of others. Such battles are quickly resolved and casualties are few, for each Azuyani is well aware their race stands on the precipice of extinction, and the sight of their dead kin often brings even the most aggrieved back to their senses. Some of these conflicts, however, have lasting consequences, most notably the breaking of craft world Aontai during the era of tears by the Asuyani of Biltan. Rarest of all internal Asuyani conflicts are those that put Phoenix Lords on opposing sides. These tragic conflicts are known as Bla Mahore, for they can be roughly translated Battle of the Undying. Two of these involved Ahra, the father of scorpions, for it was ever his way to betray those closest to him. One of the largest instances of internecine fighting came during the Council of Coalition, Eldred Orthran's attempt to unite the Elder Eye amongst the carnage of that brief but devastating battle, as you men, Jane Zar and Baharoth stood against Morgan Ra and Karandras. Whether that confrontation was based on their own political and ideological differences, or duty to their respective craft worlds, will never be known. Fugan alone maintained his discipline, helping to quickly restore order. Azuman, the Hand of Azuyan. Asuman is the first and oldest of the legendary Phoenix Lords, those most ancient of Exarchs from whom the Aspects themselves were created. Each is a demigod of battle whose legend spans the stars, imbued with supernatural powers that grant them the ability to cheat death. Asuman himself is a living embodiment of the warrior, just as the Avatar is the incarnation of the bloody-handed god himself. Asuman is known as the Hand of Asuya, for he acts as the immortal agent of the father and chief of the Eldorai gods. In the time of the fall, Azuman led his disciples into exile, abandoning his world to the horrors of the warp. He founded the first of the Aspect Warrior Shrines upon the barren world his people eventually settled, which was named Azur in honor of its claimant. This was no peaceful temple of contemplation, but a nexus of martial focus that honed the minds of its devotees just as it did their bodies, until they were sharper than any blade. From the shrine of Azur sprang the Azuya, the first Aspic warriors, and the path of the warrior was opened forever. Just as with the Exarchs that follow his path, Azuman is immortal after a fashion. Should the hand of Azuya be vanquished, his body and his essence will lie dormant for a time, until discovered by an Azuyani whose soul resonates with the spirit echo that dwells within his armored shell. The aspirant feels the call of destiny upon him, and if he is worthy, he will don Azuman's armor, taking his place, and thus his identity, so that the Phoenix Lord can be reborn to fight once again. Azuman is the forefather of the Dire Avengers, most noble and vengeful of all the aspects. He has founded more shrines or more craft worlds than any other Phoenix Lord. Soon after the inception of the Aspect Shrines, the Hand of Asuyan vanished, 
but tales of his deeds persist throughout the galaxy. There have been reports of Azuman slaying the agents of the Great Enemy from the Eye of Terror to the Eastern Fringe, and word of the towering, relentless warrior's valor and skill has spread not only throughout Azuyani culture, but also to the legends of the lesser races. Even the grandest of these accounts are not hard to believe. Azuman's skills of war are breathtaking, representing the zenith of the Dial Avenger aspect. The Phoenix Lord wears an elaborate suit of ancient armor, into which are incorporated wrist-mounted shuriken catapults of exceptional firepower. Those that do not fall to the blade storm produced by these guns must face the sword of Asur, a trial few foes have survived. This ancient weapon is the first of the dire swords, and bound within its hilt is the spirit stone of Azuman's brother, Tethesis, that he may continue the fight against the servants of the great enemy until the end of time. Such is the magnitude of Azuman's heroic presence and the example of warfare perfected that he represents, that all aspect warriors nearby, especially dire avengers, are infused with his peerless tactical acumen. Because of this, the hand of Asuyan's unexpected arrival on the field of battle continues to embolden war hosts of the craft worlds across the galaxy, his advent heralding victory against their enemies. Dire Avengers the Dire Avengers are first among the Aspect Warriors of the Azuyani. They represent the War God's unending thirst for vengeance upon a galaxy of woe, and as such, they are merciless to their foes and unstinting in their devotion to their people. Most common of all the Aspect Warriors, the Dire Avengers can trace their line back to Azumen, first of the Phoenix Lords. They are famed for being as deadly on the attack as they are immovable in defense, and are widely regarded as the most tactically flexible of all the aspects. It is often said amongst the craft world's councils of battle that an army without dire avengers is like a warrior without a heart. Throughout history, the dire avengers have proven themselves over and again. At Chogoth Delta, it was the dire avengers of the Sable Helm who slaughtered the orcs of Wa Greksh, taking such a toll on the brutish aliens that the piled corpses choked the river and caused it to burst its banks. During the liberation of Laedira, it was the dire avengers who scoured the jungles clean of human settlers once and for all, showing neither mercy nor regret as they methodically exterminated an entire planet's population. Through the millennia, a great many legends speak of dire avengers holding back nightmarish tides of demons to allow comrades to escape, of bold warriors protecting autarchs from unseen assassins, and a thousand other tales besides. Acts of valor such as these exist from the earliest days of the dire avenger aspect shrines, and are echoed to this day by their modern counterparts. Dire avengers take to the field armed with Avenger shuriken catapults. These elegant weapons are even more advanced than the shuriken catapults used by the Craftworld Guardians. Their lethal volleys echo the death of a thousand blades, the punishment that Cain meets out upon traitors and cheats who are unworthy of a clean kill. Each silent fusillade of incredibly sharp monomolecular discs is leveled with such pinpoint accuracy that they slice through armor, bone and flesh with sickening ease. The Dire Avengers consider the wielding of the shuriken an art form. Even when they are not clad in their full panoply of war, the robes they wear when outside the shrine are lined with lethal discs. In this way, even an apparently unarmed Dire Avenger can slay a distant opponent with a swift chopping gesture, a skill much needed in times of strife. Such vigilance is the hallmark of the Dire Avenger aspect, a symbol of their duty to guard their craft world at all times and to take the battle to their enemies at a moment's notice. When in battle, Dire Avengers use their Avenger shuriken catapults to create an impenetrable storm of monomolecular blades. Lightly armored warriors are slain by the dozen 
and even those in heavy battle plate are felled by the sheer volume of cutting discs. Dire Avengers have an uncanny knack of knowing when to follow their onslaught with a lightning-fast assault, and when to draw the enemy forward to the waiting blades of their more melee-focused kin. Given their incredible skill at arms, it is rare to find an Asuyani force without these warriors at its core. Dire Avenger Exarchs are masters of their aspect. They possess the uncanny ability to avoid enemy attacks, although whether this is from their own ability to anticipate incoming strikes, or the sheer paras of the souls within their inherited armor's spirit stones, is unknown. Some Dire Avenger Exarchs carry a single shuriken catapult, like the squad they lead, while others bring a pair of these weapons to battle for increased firepower. Other, more close combat-minded Exarchs wield a dire sword with a shuriken pistol, or a power glaive and a shimmer shield, an advanced field generator that projects a glimmering protective barrier around a user and the Asuyani warriors that accompany him. Jane Zar The Storm of Silence When Azumen raised the original Aspect warriors, he became the first of the Asuya, the children of Asu. First to learn under Azumen's tutelage was Jane Zar, a passionate elder eye sword maiden famed for her speed and ferocity. She and her brothers in arms learned well at the feet of their master, and in their turn they assumed the mantle of the Asuya, spreading their own teachings across the stars and founding the shrines of the warrior aspects. It was during this time that the first of the aspects were formalized, taking as a model the specialities of their founders. Great shrines were built on the craft worlds as they took to deep space so the skills of the Asuya could be conserved for all time. Once her training was complete, Jane Zar traveled the webway extensively, perfecting the abilities of her devotees and leading ever more Azuyani along the warrior path. Soon enough, there were shrines practicing her arts on every major craft world, shrines that she still frequents to this day. Of all the Phoenix Lords, Jane Zar is the most devoted to the shrines of the warrior aspects, nurturing her spiritual descendants. Although she might disappear for centuries at a time, she always returns, and the shrines maintain a special vigil for their dread mistress. Jane Zar's astonishing swiftness and mercurial temperament are echoed by her howling banshee daughters, and it was she who first perfected the scream that steals, though the psychosonic barrage that emanates from her mask can not only stun foes, but liquefy their brains in the process. The death-dealing war cry has been heard across the galaxy, and it has proven that even the immortal servants of the Dark Gods are not above fear. Jane Zar is the most active of all the Phoenix Lords in the war against the forces of the Great Enemy. She has led hundreds of howling banshees into battle on countless occasions. Even mustering them from several craft worlds at once, should she deem it necessary. Always at the forefront of a charge, she carries the Blade of Destruction, a long and elegantly balanced polearm originated from the distant past. Whirled in a blood arc, the Blade of Destruction carves through foes, twirling to parry return blows before being used as, as leverage, so Jane Zar can vault to a new position of advantage. With a flick of her wrist, the silent death is unleashed, a triple-bladed throwing weapon whose edges were forged in the ghostly flames of the warp. Black fire licks around the blade's edges as the silent death spins through the air in a graceful loop, leaving decapitated bodies in its wake before returning to its mistress. To watch Jane Zar in combat is to watch an exquisite dance. Amidst leg sweeps, dodging twists and graceful pirouettes, the glowing polearm sighs and darts until only the Phoenix Lord is left standing. No other Phoenix Lord has championed the cause of the newly risen Inari, as has Jane Zar. She has spoken passionately about the hope fostered by Aeneas and come to the aid of Ivrain and her followers on multiple occasions since their first meeting aboard Beeltan amidst the craft world's fracturing. Howling Banshees 
Howling Banshees are swift and athletic troops who are famously deadly in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and are renowned for their ability to strike down the foe before they can so much as raise a weapon to defend themselves. Key to this rapid strike is the Banshee Mask, a ritual weapon containing psychosonic amplifiers that magnify the wearer's keening battle screams into a mind-destroying shockwave. This aura assault inflicts such severe damage to the central nervous system of their foes, inspiring a feeling of mortal terror and causing momentary paralysis, even as the incoming aspect warriors close in for the kill. A full squad of banshees activating their mask in unison can secure victory before a single blow is struck. A predominantly female aspect, what these fierce warriors lack in brute strength, they make up for in precision and efficiency. While their foes reel from the auditory offensive of the Banshee masks, the shimmering power swords of the Howling Banshees slice through the armor of their foes. A ceramide-clad Chaos Space Marine is as easily slain as a hulking orc. Haughty Incubi are as easy prey as coarse and hairy Imperial Guardsmen. Foes that turn to flee are ruthlessly pounced upon, or riddled by shuriken pistol shots. Such is the speed and ferocity of the Howling Banshee's attacks that even other Aspect Warriors salute their methods with curt nods of approval. There is nothing remotely clandestine about the Howling Banshees. The fleetest of the Aspect Warriors, their preferred method of attack is to race forward on foot, acrobatic and graceful even when moving at such incredible speed but they have also been known to embark upon wave serpents or falcon grav tanks in order to close with the enemy. However they choose to reach their destination, every combatant on the battlefield will know once they do, for they announce their arrival with a dire blood-chilling scream. Such boldness might be deemed unwise for one of the most lightly armoured Eldari aspect warriors, but the Howling Banshees care not. Their ill-fated victims' death were already assured the moment they stepped onto the battlefield. Howling Banshee Exarchs have surpassed their cistern and given themselves over to their particular way of war entirely, and are second only to Jane Zar herself in their mastery of their aspect. It is they that pass on the teachings of that legendary Phoenix Lord, training their shrine's warriors in elegant swordplay, quicksilver speed, and how to focus the vocal cords to better produce the shriek that kills. So piercing and shrill are the Exarch's own war cries that echoing reverberations haunt those who hear them even after the scream has died away, slowing down their reactions long after the initial paralysis wears off. Some Exarchs forego their aspect's standard armament to instead wield an Executioner, a two-handed power glaive with even heavier hitting power, Others, devotees of certain fighting traditions within the shrine, choose instead mirror swords, a pair of reflective blades that are used to weave a whirling web of attacks. Baharoth, the cry of the wind. Baharoth is the oldest of the swooping hawks, the first exarch to master aerial combat, and the founder of the warrior path that is represented by swooping hawk shrines throughout the craft worlds. He was the most vibrant and youthful of the Phoenix Lords, reveling in the sensation of the sun on his wings. Baharoth and Morganra are brothers as the sun is to the moon, and many of the Elderai's deadliest foes have met their doom on the edges of their blades. He learned the arts of war under Azumen, when the fall was still a living memory in the minds of the Elderai. Since then, he has died and been reborn many times. Innumerable battlefields have felt the pure white light of his anger, and countless foes have fallen before him. Baharath can be translated as Cry of the Wind, for he is the master of flight and aerial warfare. Though he moves with the subtlety and grace of a zephyr, he attacks with the force of a hurricane. The Elder Eye consider his presence a sign of victory to come, for he appears above the battlefield as a glorious hero, shining with a brilliance of his own making. Looping and soaring through flak-churned skies, 
The cry of the wind loses pinpoint blasts of blinding fire into the cockpits of enemy aircraft and into those warriors who dare to venture into his domain, sending the airborne interlopers hurtling to an unmarked grave amongst their brethren below. Baharoth has mastered the art of diving into range, releasing a spray of screeching fire and then peeling away, his wings whisking him towards his next quarry. Where Baharoth passes, the ground burns with blinding white fire, for the weapons of the hawk are many, and his eyes are sharp enough to spy evil wherever it may be found. This glare is often the first and last warning his victims are granted, as he plunges like a falcon, his grenade harness sending forth its fury. Once descended upon his prey, Baharoth strikes with the resplendent sword known as the Shining Blade. Legend tells that this elegantly curved weapon was forged by the Daughters of Val, in the dying fires of a supernova, and that some of the long-gone star's astral power lives on, captured within the sword's impossible gleam. Those the blade strikes and finds impure find their own blinding reflections burning painfully into their eyes. After dispatching his foe, Baharoth leaps skyward once more, becoming a turquoise blur that flashes across the battlefield. It is recorded in the Azuyata that Baharoth's final death will come at the Ranadandra, the final battle between chaos and the material universe that will end with the destruction of both. All Elder I secretly fear that the long foretold events of the Ranadandra will be played out within their lifetime, a sense of impeding doom that has only grown more acute since the opening of the Great Rift. Given the portents of the Farseers, the waxing powers of chaos and the frequency with which the Phoenix Lords have been sighted in recent years, their fears may yet prove well-placed. Swooping Hawks In ancient times, the Elder Eye believed that the spirit of a murdered Elder would pass into a hawk and hover above the killer as a mark of guilt. The Swooping Hawks take their name from these wild hunting birds, for they are synonymous with vengeance and retribution. Much above the swooping hawk's mirrors, the winged hunters from whom they take their appellation. Their war gear is fashioned from incredibly fine cellular material, cunningly constructed so as to be incredibly light. Their wings are made from vibrating feather plates and incorporate small gravitic lifters. These enable the swooping hawks to soar high above the battlefield, with a grace and agility that inspires envy in the lesser races. When the hawks fly, their wings vibrate like those of a hummingbird, moving with such speed that they turn into a blur of color. While the hawks of Elderly myth merely mark out the guilty, the winged aspect warriors who take that hawk as their symbol play a much more active role in their foe's destruction. They have the ability to launch high into the air at a moment's notice and descend upon their foes with terrible wrath. Their ritual weapons are the Laz Blaster, a far more efficient energy weapon than the clumsy Laz Gun of the Imperium, and the Grenade Pack. These contain both anti-personnel grenades for fly-by attacks and anti-armor grenades for disabling enemy artillery. The passage of swooping hawks can often be traced by the string of explosions in their wake. The swooping hawks form an invaluable part of an Azuyani attack, their ability to descend from the skies to anywhere on the battlefield means that even as the foe is preparing for the main body of the war host, the swooping hawks arrive to disrupt their plans. The winged aspect warriors are cunning hunters, often diving from the firmament to break up potential counterattacks or to pick off vulnerable formations. These harassing tactics quickly wear down the foe, who is put into a quandary for they can turn their eyes upwards, watching the skies for telltale multicolored streaks. Then their ground-based enemies are given free reign to approach them. But if they disregard the swooping hawks altogether, they are quickly pounced upon. Leading the individual squads of swooping hawks are Exarchs, the greatest disciples of Baharath. It is they that teach the warriors of the swooping hawk shrines the intricacies of flight, including how to perform sky leaps in the heat of battle. 
returning to the firmament so as to descend once more where they are needed. Their appearance in a war host is viewed as a favourable omen, and all who bask in their resplendent glow find their morale bolstered. Many sweeping hawk exarchs bear a hawk's talon, which offers increased strength and rate of fire than their aspect's ritual las blaster. The Sky Talons of Bealtan Sweeping hawks are integral to the Bealtan assault upon the Astro Militarum garrisons on the planet Ildruk, better known to the Elder Eye as the maiden world of Illyrissa. The Azuyani told the humans to leave Illyrissa or be annihilated. The Imperials refused and entrenched themselves within a dozen different fortified compounds scattered across the fertile world. Despite the great catastrophe that all but ruined their craft world, Bealtan had not faltered in their rabid defense of plants claimed by their race. The sword wind would simply have to do more with less. A single war host was dispatched to cleanse Elerissa, a force outnumbered by the humans a hundred times over. Yet the humans were predictable, hunkering behind defenses and relying upon cleared kill zones. The swooping hawks of the Sky Talon Shrine descended upon them, timing their attacks to coincide with those of their kin. Imperial soldiers were forced to either turn their attentions from the oncoming wave serpents and falcon grav tanks, or ignore the volleys of las blasts and grenade runs that exploded down the trench lines. Twelve assaults, twelve Bealtan victories, all successful thanks to the aerial support of the Sky Talons. Fugen, the Burning Lance. When the Asuya made their way across the galaxy, it was Fugen who founded the shrines of the Fire Dragons upon the craft worlds. The warrior aspect whose teachings advocate the utter annihilation of the enemy, so that their demise is assured beyond all doubt. Fugen schooled his disciples in the arts of wielding fire and flame of channeling and mastering the powers of the dragon. It was his hope that the Elder Eye could bring harmony through selective destruction, rather than regarding oblivion as a force that could only bring discord. Fugen is a mighty hero to the Craftworlders, often depicted holding the cosmic serpents of wisdom and entropy in his fiery grasp. In his footsteps, entire worlds are set ablaze, for the dragon of Elderai myth is synonymous with destruction. Fugen's gaze is flame. Smoke rises from the blistering skin of those who do not address him with the proper respect, and those who truly earn his wrath are swiftly reduced to ash. In many ways, it is Fugen who most embodies the aspect warrior's obsession with their deadly craft. He devotes himself completely to the systematic and total persecution of the Asuyani's enemies, pitilessly culling them one by one until their deaths form an unbroken chain of retribution stretching across the universe. The Elder I believe that, with this chain, Fugen intends to bind the dragon at the end of days, though such a feat would mean mastery over destruction itself. Legend also has it, that the Burning Lance will be the last of his brethren to fall in the final battle of the Rana Dandra, when the footsteps of demon kings and demigods shake the earth. After the destruction of Asu, Fugen disappeared for many centuries. He reappeared during the final battle of Haran Shimash, the world of blood and tears, where, fighting at Eldred Ulthran's side, he scoured a score of demon lords from the planet with a fire pike from which he takes his name, and claimed a dozen more with his rune-covered axe. The wounds suffered by the Phoenix Lord only increased his resolve, and Fugen grew stronger and stronger as the fight progressed, the fury of his attacks blazing even hotter, until finally the last foe was felled. Once that conflict was done, Fugen vanished into the webway. He has travelled its ancient tunnels ever since. He emerges only when it serves his noble cause, tracking down the enemies of his forebears and reducing them to ash and smoke. Of late, the flames of the Phoenix Lord's fire pike have burned hotter and more often than ever before.
You're the hand that must cast the spear of flames, control the dragon, channel its power, and in all things maintain absolute focus. Only the concentrated beam can penetrate, and only that which is tempered will not break. Finally, be not afraid. In the end, everything burns. Fugan, the script of Exarchs. Fire Dragons The Fire Dragon aspect styles itself upon the Dragon of Elderai myth, the sinuous, fire-breathing reptile that represents wanton destruction. All Fire Dragon aspect warriors are aggressive and warlike, and seek nothing less than the total annihilation of their chosen foes. They have an unsurpassed mastery of weapons that use heat or flame as their main form of destruction, and take savage delight in the devastation they create. Such is their connection to fire, that it is said their exarchs manifest a burning corona when the murder lust is upon them. Within their aspect shrines, every fire dragon undergoes a great many hazardous trials and dangerous rituals to hone their abilities and master the methods of war that they will unleash if their craft world is threatened. Thanks to this training, a fire dragon knows at a glance which parts of a target will be most susceptible to his weapons, and has learned how best to collapse even the sturdiest of buildings upon their occupants. This knowledge transcends the mere study of schematics, and becomes as much spiritual knowledge as tactical expertise. It is said that a fire dragon exarch knows instinctively how to best kill a tank with just a single shot even if he has never seen that particular engine of war before. The ritual weapons of these aspect warriors, known as fusion guns, can reduce otherwise impenetrable armor plating to a cloud of superheated vapor in a single superheated moment. As Yuyani fusion weapons cause the molecules of the target to hypervibrate, generating so much heat that they burst into flames before turning to molten liquid and then simply evaporating. With such weapons, the fire dragons are fully capable of meeting and slaying any foe that the enemy might send against them. However, the fire dragons know well their role within the war host, utterly annihilating the most redoubtable strongholds and war machines the enemy can muster. Against hordes of lesser foes, such as the numberless green-skinned tribes or the chittering beasts of the Tyranids. The fire dragon's precise and powerful weapons are less than ideal, and they cannot inflict enough casualties to sway the course of a battle. However, against elite foes, the fire dragons are invaluable. The space marines, in particular, have learned to be wary of the fire dragon aspect, and the tank pilots of both the Imperial Guard and the Tower Empire know from experience that the fiery colors of the dragon spell certain destruction for even their most heavily armored vehicles. To increase their chances of destroying the right target at the right moment, the fire dragons often utilize falcon grav tanks to close with their chosen foe before they can flee. So transported, they strike hard and fast at principal targets, whilst the falcon's anti-infantry weaponry keeps the foe at bay. Once the victim is a blazing ruin, the fire dragons swiftly re-embark and the vehicle carries the aspect warriors towards their next quarry. Should the Elder Eye Warhouse need to eliminate an enemy bunker or breach an enemy fortress, it is the fire dragons that the Autark calls upon. Against such static fortifications and the lumbering war machines many of their foes employ, they use discus-shaped melter bombs that can be skillfully attached to any surface and detonated with but a word. Nowhere is safe from the white-hot rage of the fire dragons, for even the mightiest defensive structure or the thickest ferrocrete walls affords but a few moments of precious protection against them. The exarchs of the fire dragons are truly accomplished in their craft. Many go to war in the manner of Fugan, bearing the weapon known as a fire pike. Its range is superior to the standard fusion guns carried by the warriors who follow the Exarch into battle. Others choose a Dragon's Breath Flamer, a weapon that is ideal when pitted against the very thing the Fire Dragons are not, 
massed enemy troops. With a single blast, an exarch can clear a swathe of foes from an objective or prevent his squad from being overrun. Karandras, the Shadow Hunter Karandras is the most mysterious of the Phoenix Lords. No one knows where his shrine originally lay. Perhaps it was on one of the smaller craft worlds that survived the fall but was doomed soon after. Or perhaps it does not exist in the material dimension at all. The Phoenix Lord speaks rarely, and of his own origins not at all. But a single shift in his stance can carry deadly meaning, for his aura is thick with menace. Be they Elder Eye or not, few have set eyes upon Karandras and lived to tell of it, ensuring the secrets that surround him persist. Karandras is not the oldest of the Exarchs of the Striking Scorpions, for that honor belongs to Ahra, the father of Scorpions. Ahra was the most sinister of all the Phoenix Lords, the fallen Phoenix who burns with the dark light of chaos. Karandras took Ahra's place after his defection, tempering the murderous nature of his predecessor with the patience of the hunter. It is whispered in the shattered reaches of the webway that Ahra still lives, and that he fled to the darkest corners of Elderai civilization to begin his murderous teachings anew. Rumors persist that the rival Phoenix Lords dueled with each other for weeks in the shattered ruins of Xandras, over the shrine of the slicing orbs and the mysteries it contains, and that only one walked away with what passed for his soul intact. As with many of the secrets that owe their beginnings to the Scorpion, the truth yet remains hidden from mortal sight. While Ahra left an indelible mark upon the practices of the striking Scorpion shrines, the patience of the hunter that now pervades the Aspect's teachings comes from Karandras alone. A squad of striking scorpions under Karandras's tutelage will crouch motionless in darkness, forsaking breath altogether as they wait for the optimum moment to dart out and strike at the enemy's heart. Karandras himself embodies this skill on a far grander level. His armored body may lay hidden and dormant for decades, lurking in the twilights between worlds until the Elder Eye race needs his intervention. Just as all seems lost, the Shadow Hunter will burst from legend into horrific life. Time and again, Karandras has arrived from some unexpected quarter of the battlefield, the shuriken catapult built into his claw blazing as the Phoenix Lord quickly closes the gap with his foes. It is in close quarters where Karandras excels. Once in the press of melee, the vastly superior Mandy Blaster known as the Scorpion's Bite, a hell-mounted weapon that produces a deadly, short-range sting, strikes too quickly for the eyes to follow. His victims reeling, Karandras will spring forward to rip them to shreds with his raised claw and diamond-tipped chainsword. Many who fall in such a way die unaware of the nature of the terrible fate that befell them, for as quickly as they appeared from the darkness, the Phoenix Lord returns to it. For Karandras was born from the shadow, and it is shadow that is his ally to this day. Striking Scorpions The Striking Scorpions epitomize the deadly attributes of their namesake, for they are the stealthiest and most dangerous of all the close assault aspects. Each warrior has learned to draw strength from the darkness and rage that once weighed heavy on their soul and has made fear their closest ally. They are merciless killers without exception, reveling only in the hunt and the kill. The most sinister skill of the striking scorpion is a legacy of their phoenix lord, Karandras, the ability to become one with the shadows, creeping ever closer before falling upon the foe with the unbridled wrath of Cain himself. The heavier armor plates that form the striking scorpion's aspect armor deny them the outright swiftness of their banshee sisters. Instead, these aspect warriors excel at slinking through dense terrain, using every available hiding place to close with their prey. It is said that they will lie in wait for days without motion, waiting patiently for their victim to expose its weakness. When the attack comes, it does so with the force of a lightning bolt. 
shuriken pistols spit, and scorpion's chainsaws whir. Vicious blades with diamond tooth edges that chew through armor to mangle and tear flesh. This patient yet murderous nature has been the doom of many an enemy whose attention drifted from the shadows for even a moment too long. The signature attack of the striking scorpion is made by the deadly weapons housed in pods on either side of the warrior's helmet, known as Mandy Blasters. They are short-ranged laser weapons used to deliver a deadly energy sting in close combat. Activated by a psychic pickup, they fire a hail of needle-thin shards that act as conductors for a highly charged laser. The foe scarcely has time to reel in shock at the sudden appearance of the Aspect Warriors before the Mandy Blaster sting hits home. Capitalizing on the advantage provided by their opening volley, the striking scorpions deliver a blistering flurry of blows, pressing home more and more attacks. There are many conflicts in which the striking scorpions have risen unexpectedly from cover and charged a foe's center, wreaking so much carnage that they single-handedly turned close-fought battles into routs. Such is the menace that lurks unseen in the shadows that even the threat of an Azuyani attack causes the most steadfast of warriors to jump at the least movement, for they know well what might be stalking them at that very moment, poised to strike when a moment of opportunity presents itself. Masters of stealth and close quarters butchery Striking scorpions are rightly feared by even the best defended of foes, but it is their exarchs that are dreaded most of all. These sinister figures are even more skilled in battle than the aspect warriors they lead to battle, and carry war gear that is yet more devastating. With the gigantic chainsword known as the Biting Blade, an exarch can cleave his opponents in two with a single swing, whilst the fabled Scorpion's Claw can tear open the armor of even a Tau battlesuit in a heartbeat. Morgan Ra, the Harvester of Souls. Altansar was one of the many craft worlds, large and small, that survived the fall. It rode out the initial psychic shockwaves that destroyed the Eldorai realms, but was subsequently caught in the gravity well to the Eye of Terror. Although the Asuyani of Altansar fought valiantly against the encroachment of chaos, they were unable to escape their inevitable doom. Within five hundred years of the fall, their craft world was swallowed whole into the warp. The only soul that escaped the clutches of this roiling warp storm was the phoenix lord known as Morgan Ra, the harvester of souls, the most accomplished of Altansar's exarchs and founder of the aspect of Dark Reapers. When Azumen taught his brethren the arts of war, it was Morgan Ra that fell furthest from the fold. He fashioned Baroque weapons of occult nature, not for him the shining blades of his brethren, but instead dark and malefic artifacts that could slay his foes from afar. As his craft progressed, Morgan Ra learnt that even the most outlandish of weapons could be used with the precision of a scalpel. This discovery, and his mastery of each of the diverse facets of ranged combat, is behind the disciplines of the Dark Reaper aspect, as well as the creation of the Morgatar. This scythe-like weapon, built into a shrieker pattern shuriken cannon, fires mind-linked discs charged enough to decapitate a swathe of foes before vanishing into nothingness, and the curved blade it sports is worthy of its grim reputation. Ten thousand years after the Eye of Terror swallowed Morgan Ra's homeworld, that nightmarish realm vomited the lesions of chaos into the material universe, leaving a gaping lesion in space where real space and the warp coexisted. Whilst the rift was still open and the armies of that hell plane were spewing forth, Morgan Ra took his chance. He plunged into the unreality of the warp and searched its malignant reaches for what was left of his lost people. As told in the macabre, Bas Finskeeli blaze, Morgan Ra eventually found the remains of his craft world. The Elder Eye of Altansa lived on still, after a fashion. Morgan Ra guided what was left of his craft world out of the Eye of Terror, and led them against the forces of chaos to deny them their victory. However, at the war councils that followed Altansar's return, 
there was no welcome from the other craftworld autarchs for their long-lost kin. Though the Phoenix Lord's people certainly fought hard, they were secretive and unsettling, and spoke only in whispers. Of the Asuyani of Altansar, the same question continues to be asked, though never in Morganra's presence. How could any living elder eye remain untouched by the predations of the Eye of Terror for so many millennia? Because of his people's suffering, none harbor such a strong abhorrence for chaos as does Morgan Ra. But where Fugan's rage burns hot, the harvester of souls is as cold as the grave. The opening of the Great Rift has afforded him many opportunities to reap a bloody tally of the hated foe, and he has seized every one. Dark Reapers In all things, the Dark Reapers take their learnings from the Phoenix Lord Morgan Ra, the most grim and foreboding of all Azuyani. Morgan Ra teaches that the kiss of death can be delivered from afar with grace and ruthless efficiency. It is this credo that is central to the way of the Reaper. The Dark Reapers are the most menacing of the warrior aspects. Their skull-helmed visage is a spine-chilling sight in itself, but to the Elder Eye, it has a symbolism altogether darker than simple death. The Dark Reapers exemplify the War God as Destroyer, and their formidable warsuits echo that of their founder, the Harvester of Souls. The battle armor of these ominous aspect warriors is the color of midnight and cold to the touch. It incorporates a complex set of interlocking plates that provide formidable protection and an impressively stable platform from which to fire their heavy weaponry. This combination of durability and stability makes Dark Reapers relatively slow to attack when compared to the aspect warriors of other shrines, though it matters little, for their role on the battlefield has ever been one of long-ranged fire support. The sacred weapon of the Dark Reaper is the Reaper Launcher. This long-barreled weapon can create a blistering firestorm with but a single salvo of Star Swarm missiles. This is not the clumsy bombardment of other races, however, but a pinpoint volley aimed for the heart. Alternatively, Reaper launchers can fire armor-piercing Starshot missiles, which have the punch to smash through the battle plate of the traitor legions, tear apart tyrannid carapaces, and even wreck light vehicles. Only the most heavily armored of foes can hope to escape. The Dark Reapers pride themselves on their precision, and much of their training within the Aspect Shrine is devoted to the challenge of attaining the perfect shot. During their punishing battle rites, a Dark Reaper is expected to display incredible feats of coordination, focus, and balance. Their obsessive, unflinching nature resonates strongly with the image of the Dark Reapers as formidable, stoic warriors, whose baleful gaze haunts the battlefield from afar. The already sublime skills of the Dark Reapers are further increased by powered limb supports within their armor that absorbs the recoil of the Reaper launcher. Advanced sensor vanes mounted upon the sides of their helmets lock onto a fast-moving target, making their volleys all but impossible to evade. For especially complex shots, a Reaper can utilize an elaborate mind link that enables him to see from the muzzle of his weapon, giving rise to the adage the death blooms where a reaper's gaze falls. Dark Reaper Exarchs are masters of their aspect, crack shots who have spent the equivalent of many human lifetimes perfecting their marksmanship. Following in Morgan Ra's footsteps, many have mastered the use of a wide variety of long-ranged weapons and, should doing so provide a tactical advantage, will forego a reaper launcher in favor of a shuriken cannon, tempest launcher, or missile launcher. Regardless of their armament, entire wars have been known to go by without a Dark Reaper Exarch missing a single shot. Should they fire wide, however, they will all recall it well, for such mishaps must be atoned for once they return to their shrine. Shining Spears The Shining Spears possess a bright and clear virtue that marks each one out as a warrior hero and a champion of their race. Elder Eye mythology is replete with examples of noble heroes at one with their steed, and in the Shining Spears, the glories of legend are made manifest once more. In battle, 
they fight as the spear of Caleb Munchuk Kane, which struck like lightning and killed with a single blow. Shining spears ride sleek, gleaming jet bikes to war, their vehicles anti-gravitic motors, allowing them to skim over even the roughest terrain at breakneck pace. Such is their focus that the shining spears can weave through dense jungles and crumbling architecture without slowing, for they dodge and weave around obstacles that would cause a spectacular collision, an explosive ending for a rider of lesser skill. Each aspect warrior is so in tune with his jet bike that he can execute complex high-speed aerial maneuvers with only subtle movements of his hand upon the control console. He instinctively knows the absolute limits of his mount, confidently throwing his jet bike into vertical climbs and dazzling corkscrew spins that even the most gifted pilots of other races cannot hope to match. Such skills are honed through countless years spent within the Aspect Shrines, structures so vast that it takes days to walk from one side to the other. It is said that, whilst there, the Shining Spears never leave the saddle, even when engaged in meditation, and that they can feel the flow of the land beneath them by subtle variations in the hum of their anti-gravitic motors, steering confidently even with their eyes shut tight. In battle, this ability to control their jet bikes at top speed allows them to swerve and jink, making it all but impossible for enemy gunners to draw a bead upon them. The ritual armament of the Shining Spear's aspect is the Laser Lance. This long and formidable weapon conceals a cunningly wrought device that can deliver a powerful laser blast at short range. With this lance, a rider can deliver a devastating blow even before his charge hits home, but is usually employed just as the Shining Spear makes their attack run into the foe. This unexpected volley fails the front ranks of the enemy in a blaze of light leaving the way clear for the Shining Spears to charge through into the choicest of targets beyond. As the Shining Spear streaks forwards, the head of the Laser Lance strikes home with an incandescent flash and a devastating piercing impact. The Shining Spears are famous for the sheer daring and persistence of their attacks. After delivering a fusillade of shots and blows, they will disengage and circle, barely slowing in the process. In this manner, the Shining Spears are constantly in motion, a constant threat that is impossible to pin down. Such are the tactics taught to them by the Exarchs of their shrine, the most accomplished warriors of their aspect. Their battlecraft honed by centuries of often painful experience. It is a Shining Spear Exarch's right to bear to war one of their shrine's most sacred weapons, a Star Lance, a heavier and harder hitting version of the Laser Lance, or a Paragon Saber, a power weapon of ancient days, mind forged by the fabled bone singers of Seath Kaeli, the creators of the legendary Stardock that fathered all craft worlds. Crimson Hunters The Aspect Warriors, known as the Crimson Hunters, are amongst the most unusual of their kind. Their ritual war gear is not blade or sidearm, but instead a sleek aerial fighter that represents the pinnacle of Asujani aeronautics. These formidable craft, known as Nightshade Interceptors, are just as much part of the Crimson Hunter's battle gear as a Howling Banshee's power sword or the Dire Avenger's shuriken catapult. Their lethality, however, is measured on a different scale altogether. The Crimson Hunters are few in number, though their shrines are becoming ever more widespread. These temples of Cain are unlike any other, they are not buildings or landscapes, but tunnel-linked collections of transparent atriums that float around the periphery of their craft worlds, like archipelagios at the edge of a vast landmass. It is within these realms of captive sky that the Crimson Hunters duel, their weapons of choice, the bright lances and pulse lasers gracing each interceptor's curving fuselage. During the breakneck battles that take place in these shrines, the weapons of the Crimson Hunters are set to illuminate rather than to pierce, for the Nightshade Interceptor has been designed specifically to hunt down and destroy aircraft of any kind, even those of the Dark Kin. A single beam of light can be the difference between victory and defeat, though it is said that the reflexes of a Crimson Hunter are so preternaturally sharp 
that they can invade even those. By training every night against their own kind, in essence, the most gifted fighting pilots in the galaxy, the proud warriors of the Crimson Hunters, ensure that the act of destroying the aircraft of the lesser races is a simple exercise that proves their superiority over the sluggish, would-be pilots that pollute the skies of the universe. The Crimson Hunters embody the war god Cain's ability to leave a more powerful foe reeling and ready for slaughter. Soaring through the air in a blur of color, they hunt down and destroy the aircraft of the foe, ensuring total air superiority. Crimson Hunter Exarchs are the most skilled of their kind, and it is a rare day when such marksmen miss their shot, even when moving at incredible speed. Although some Exarchs maintain the same weaponry as the warriors they command, others replace their vehicle's bright lances with star cannons, adding greater volume to their firepower. The Bloody Blades of Cain Amongst the myths of the Elderai is the tale of the bloody-handed god's triumph of the white worm Organothir, an armoured serpent whose titanic bulk was such that it eclipsed the sun whenever it rose up to strike. The legend tells that Cain hunted the great beast across the stars, eventually finding the beast's nest in the heart of a hollow moon. Just as the beast emerged from its lair, Cain hurled a pair of bloody blades fashioned from the gore that dripped from his left hand. These darting daggers took the beast's eyes from their sockets, had ensured that the behemoth's death was a feat within Cain's reach. It is these blinding blades that the Crimson Hunters seek to emulate in battle. Warp Spiders The Warp Spiders take their name from the tiny but aggressive creatures that are seen amongst the slender race-bone trees of the Dome of the Crystal Seers. These sparkling entities can move anywhere within the craft world, melting their arachnid bodies into the infinity circuit and crystallizing to reappear at a new location. They are attracted in vast numbers to invasive psychic entities, which they hunt and destroy in the manner of an immune system. The warp spider aspect warriors epitomize the doctrine of aggressive defense, attacking without warning from an unseen quarter. This is made possible due to their signature war gear, an arcane dimensional device that allows the warp spiders to mimic the way their namesakes teleport around the craft world. Using a compact warp generator housed within their armored backpack, warp spiders can make short warp jumps, disappearing and reappearing in the blink of an eye. This enables them to make the totally unexpected attacks on their foes that have become their hallmark. Such a tactic is not without substantial risk, however, for it necessitates the aspect warriors spending a short time in the hell dimension of the warp. The warp is a perilous place for any soul to travel. This risk is greatest of all for the Elderai, for their immortal foe Slanesh constantly thirsts for their songs. A journey through the warp, however brief, is a matter of incredible danger. Regardless of allegiance, the foul demons that inhabit that realm each delight in ensnaring passing Elrai spirits and making them their playthings for eternity. For this reason, the warp spiders are considered by the Azuyani to be the bravest of all aspects. They risk not only their lives in the name of victory, but also their eternal souls. The ritual armament of the warp spider is the Death Spinner, an exotic and highly advanced weapon that extrudes a cloud of razor-sharp monofilament wire. The spinner's magnetic containment fields then spools the wire together and hurls it towards the enemy. The wire's tension causes it to writhe and lash in the air, and where it touches flesh or soft tissue, the wire slices through with horrible ease, severing limbs and dicing flesh. Those trapped upon the path of the warp spider become exarchs. It is their duty to teach and drill the warriors of their shrine, and it is not one that they take lightly. They guide their charges through the dangerous and intricate processes behind surviving warp jumps, showing them how to steal their mind and spirit to survive the horrors of the Immaterium. In battle, they show themselves to be the true experts in monofilament weaponry, 
able to slice their victims into a thousand slivers with a twitch of their trigger fingers. Some warp spider exiles equip themselves with a pair of power blades, boosting their close combat capability. End quote. Now please be aware that I have left out a few of the less important or prolific aspects than some of the Phoenix Lords who are not presently active, like Lacosidae. But know that I shall get to them in the future, should there be the appetite for further Elder content. Now I hope you can see why they are so lauded, so adored by their faction players, and by the lore snafflers and game historian alike. They are a fundamental element of the setting, and one of its brightest jewels. For yes, they are directly attributable to the Eldar of Professor Tolkien, with a huge dollop of the Numenorean plotline in their downfall. But they are now so much more than their roots, their genesis. For the Eldar have an aesthetic and flavor that is one of the most alluring and romantic in all of this setting, and one I play with great pride. For in the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. Why would you settle for anything less than the ultimate warrior race, fielding the ultimate weapons of destruction? I have been Baltimore, your faithful servant. I hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction to Aspect Warriors and Phoenix Lords. If so, then please consider liking and subscribing. If you do, then hit the notifications button, as I would not want you to miss out. If you see the worth in what we are doing, then do also consider joining our Patreon, or giving the video a share if that is beyond your present scope. It would be a great boon. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.